This is Launching Your Daughter Podcast, and I'm your host, Nicole Burgess, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. The information shared in this podcast is not a substitute for seeking help from a licensed mental health professional. Now, here is today's episode. Episode 47. Well, welcome, everybody. My guest today is Daniela Polone, a licensed marriage and family therapist who practices in Westlake Village, California. Daniela specializes in supporting people living with chronic pain, illness, anxiety, and depression. In today's episode, she shares mindfulness and emotional freedom techniques, along with the science behind how these techniques can help manage those symptoms. Daniela discusses how parents who have chronic pain or illness can stay connected to their daughter and ways parents can support their daughter if she has chronic pain or illness. Now here is today's episode. Well, welcome, Daniela. I am so excited to have you on today and have you share more about who you are and what you do in regards to chronic pain, how that impacts our our families that are across all over the world, and how you give support not only to parents, but also, you know, adults and how they can also maybe parents can support their teenage daughters if they're struggling with some chronic pain or anxiety. So, so excited to to have a conversation with you today. Well, thank you so much for having me. I'm excited to be on your podcast. I would love it if you could share a little bit more with our listeners, like what it is that you do and, and why you actually do what you do. Well, I'm a licensed marriage and family therapist, and I have an office in Westlake Village, which is in Southern California. And basically, in my practice, I focus on giving support to people who have chronic pain, chronic illness, medical trauma, um, and I give support to parents, adults, young adults, adolescents. It just depends on you know what they're experiencing, and I just try to give them a nice balance of information to kind of help them feel empowered that they know more and they can better understand what might be going on with them emotionally and physically. Also, just giving them some resources to use. So it's a combination of things to really give them that emotional support um, and also give them a sense of feeling, you know, empowered in, in other aspects in certain ways over what's going on with them physically or with their loved one who's going through chronic pain. Excellent. I love that. And and I know part of how I actually heard about you is you had done a different podcast with another colleague of ours. And I know on that podcast, you had shared so much about kind of the some of the misunderstandings about chronic pain, not only how it impacts the person as an individual, but how it also impacts family members or loved ones. And I'm wondering if you could share just a little bit more about how you one, I guess, help support that person when they come in and they're seeking, you know, whether it's getting more education and normalizing kind of where they are or helping them through that chronic pain, if you would mind sharing a little bit more about that. Yeah, absolutely. So I think the first thing I do is I kind of just really want to reach out and connect with them on that person to person level. Like, hey, we're all human beings. We all have different things that happen in our lives. And I also share with them, and I'm pretty open about it too on my website and on that podcast that I have my own history of chronic pain and chronic illness. And I'm in my 30s. You know, I'm relatively young. And um, this has been something I've been dealing with for over eight years. And it's just been a marathon of ups and downs, both physically and emotionally. And so while I don't get into the details with the person coming in for the first time, because it's not about me, I just give them enough to know, hey, this is kind of the why as to why I am so honored that I get to work with you. Because while I might not know exactly what you're going through emotionally and physically, I've kind of walked a similar path as you. And so I just want you to know that I'm here for you. And I hope that, you know, you feel that I understand you and get you on a lot of levels that outside of this space, you might not be feeling that patience and compassion and understanding from outside, from the outside world. So that, that is like a big one, you know, that people are just like relieved. It's like, oh, really? Or they see that on my website and they're like, this is why I wanted to see you because I feel like you get me Mm -hmm. (laughs) and I haven't met you yet. I'm like, great. (laughs) Yeah. So. And, and you've hit it too. There is there is a lot of misunderstandings from those who don't necessarily deal with chronic pain or illness and maybe don't understand how that impacts the family. So could you give a little more information or talk a little bit more about 
I guess whether it's kind of removing some of the myths or gaining a little more awareness of like, what does chronic pain or how does that typically or can it not maybe typically, but how can it impact families, whether they're an adult or they're an adolescent? Because you said, I mean, you you've been dealing with this for years now and you're mm-hmm. young. And again, most of the time, the clients that I've worked with in the past, it's just because they're not wearing, you know, a cast or they're not in a wheelchair or they're not having crutches. It seems like it can be difficult for folks to see that it's like, yeah, there's something going on internally that is medically related, but -hmm. they don't quite get that. So I love if you could kind of shed a little more light on that. Yeah, you know, um, I think a common experience for people with chronic pain that they receive either from their family, whether it's immediate or distant family or extended family or friends or colleagues or doctors, whatever, wherever they are, you know, there can be an experience where they feel like they're kind of being judged, um, like, oh, you're not really sick, like you're fine, you're not limping or um, I don't see that, you know, you've had a leg amputated or that you have bandages indicating you recently had surgery. I don't know what, you know, I don't know what you're complaining about. Like, you know, so there can be a bit of judgment. And I think underneath that really is, um, hey, outside person is actually feeling kind of uncomfortable. Yeah. (laughs) And so they're not really sure how to handle it because or they don't know what to say. Mm -hmm. Um, And so there's there can be an element of judgment or criticism or thoughts of like, well, that person kind of is being high maintenance or demanding like they're really needing a lot of attention. Why? You know, why are they you know, why do they look sick? Like they must be faking it or something so that it can be it can be kind of like that. So it's unfortunate that that's the case. But I think a lot of the times just in our human experience, we need to have physical visual evidence to kind of point point mm-hmm. in that direction. And that can also be the person who's in pain. That can be their experience too within the medical community. Unless something can be diagnostically scanned, x-rayed, imaged in some way or tested and they continue and the patient continues to say, hey, you know, this pain is not going away or this this part of my body is not working properly and and it's it's causing me a lot of pain that can sometimes fall on deaf ears too because you know they're following the medical model and they're like listen I hear you but I don't see anything to support that Mm -hmm. Um, and so it can be like hitting a wall and feeling frustrated so the person with the chronic pain or the chronic uh, health issue can really feel like burdened it can be like this like weight on their shoulders of like okay can be isolating where they they're feeling just like I'm reaching out for help but when I do I get shut down you know Mm -hmm. I'm not getting I'm not getting a oh wow I'm so sorry that sounds really hard I mean even something like that can can go a long way absolutely yeah and so I'm sorry I didn't answer your question about the family so yeah I can have this domino effect of of you know if if mom or dad is dealing with this and they're feeling kind of all alone and unsupported you know in the from outside contacts that can have a ripple effect and they can feel depressed sad it can make them angry you know all of these things and of course that's going to be um that's going to resonate within the household and the kids are going to feel it and and see it um show up in different ways so how can the parents then if whether their children are still living at home or maybe their daughter has you know moved out how can they really one get the support that they need and how can they I guess, what are some of the the tools or things that they could do to help Mm -hmm. relieve some of that that depression? Because you're absolutely right. When you've got chronic pain or there's chronic illness, there can be anxiety and depression. And I know you talk about that on your website as well. Mm -hmm. How can they then help kind of relieve or cope with those things better before you and I get into how can they Mm -hmm. also stay connected to their daughters? I think what they can do is just kind of of think back of like, hmm, what in the past have I done that I really enjoyed that helps me feel better about things? Okay, maybe back then I didn't have this particular condition, but when I was feeling down, what was helpful then? Oh, maybe talking to my college, you know, my former college roommate, you know, that we're still friends, you know, maybe, maybe, you know, I can reach out to her once in a while and have that like connection over the phone or in person. You know, what social, what relationships does that person have where they feel like they have a bit of an outlet or what activities do they, you know, do they enjoy that kind of fill them up and, and bring light into their life 
that they are able to continue to do now, whether it's something artistic like pottery or, you know, painting or just writing, any kind of expression, just some some kind of an emotional outlet, just journaling, something like that. But any, I would stress also, again, the social, the social aspect, you know, who is in your community? Who is your support network? And it's one thing for people to say, hey, I'm here for you, but it's another for them to follow through on it. So you really communicating, hey, you know what? I've got a lot of pain right now in my back and I just can't, I can't take my daughter to after school practice. Can you take her? You know, like what kind of steps can that grown up, can that parent set in place to have options so they don't feel like they have to do it and other people can come in and, and help Oh, I love that reminder because I mean, I, it's as you talked earlier. You know, it's there's there's so much that 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 parent, that adult, is already managing and trying to deal with. So I love it's one, it's advocating for themselves in the sense of, hey, if I have family members or friends who I know are supportive, it's totally okay for me to ask for support. It's okay for me to put out a request like, yeah, I can't take my daughter to this dance lesson tonight because of the chronic pain in my back. And it, it's like continuing to ask for that support where they need it versus mm-hmm. saying, oh, gosh, you know, I've already asked too many times. It's like, well, check it out with the person. You mm-hmm. know, the other person you're making that request with, they can tell you no. Then you may need mm-hmm. to go find, you know, somebody else that can do this task for you. And it's all okay. There's nothing wrong with you being human and right. needing extra support. So I love that reminder that those social aspects are very, very important, not just if you're dealing with chronic pain or illness, but just mm-hmm. as us as human beings, we definitely need to have that person to person support as well. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. You know, and, and just having that sense of community. I mean, we're in our nature, we are human, we are human beings, we crave connection, we, we need it um, to thrive and, and succeed in life. And so if that comes up with help from a neighbor or a friend or a relative, or if you're involved in your local community church or, you know, whatever, you know, social outlets that you've already are a part of, then why not? You know, it's also, it can be easy to say, but it can also be hard to implement at first Mm -hmm. because there's, you know, we have pride, you Mm -hmm. know, and, and so asking for help can, can be a bit of a, of a change of like, well, I've been able to do everything on my own before, or I've been able to figure out X, Y, and Z in the past. So I can do this now too. And it's like, I'm sure you can, but there's nothing wrong with, you know, asking for some support. And um, it's not a reflection of you not being a good parent or feeling like a failure, because there are these expectations that we all have of how we should be either as a parent, a spouse, um, a family member, a friend. And then if that idea or those criteria that we have set up in our in our minds gets challenged because we have chronic pain, you know, that can be a bit of a of a difficult adjustment. And so there could be some resistance. And I think what comes up a lot that people might not necessarily think about is that they're grieving. You know, they're yeah. kind of going through these stages of grief, of denial. Like they could be in that denial phase. I'm fine. I, I don't need help. <laughs> And then, you know, acceptance, hopefully, towards the end. Yeah. And I love that reminder, too, that we do, we, we sometimes live in, at least here in the, in the States, the U.S., that y- you've got to be such an individual person, even mm-hmm. if you're in a family, right? Mm-hmm. And it's like, oh, no, there is this expectation, especially for parents. You know, you guys, you got to do everything perfectly or all on your own. And it's not okay to continue to ask for help. And at mm-hmm. the same time, it's, it is challenging those thoughts, those belief systems. And it's like, hey, if you need more support, it is okay. So keep doing what you need to do to advocate for yourself and for your family of what it is that you need or you want. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I think what's really good is, is reframing it like, okay, once, once that person is better able to kind of acknowledge that this is in fact happening and it might not change for a long while, or it might not ever change is reframing it of like, okay, by me seeking out support and communicating what it is that I need from from this person and that person. I'm actually really caring for myself and in turn by me putting that extra attention into what it is that I need to support my mind and my body, I am 
have more inner resources to really be the parent that I that I strive to be, to get closer to meeting more of these criteria or expectations that I want to have in strengthening my relationship with my daughter. You know, I don't want my daughter to see me cranky and moody and sad sleeping all the time. You know, maybe if I'm having a rough day, I can get her to go hang out with her friends so she doesn't necessarily see that all the time or, you know, so so by putting in this self-care, it's really it's to the benefit of not just the that parent, but to the whole family of building up their inner stamina, their inner strength, their way to cope emotionally and physically to then really have that opportunity to connect with their children and with their spouse. Yeah, and I love how you segued into that because that is it. Again, it's really changing that mindset of self-care is so important. Self-care is not selfishness. Exactly. Yeah, and so to be able to have good self-care skills, you really can be there for your kids, for your teenager, for your daughter, and mm-hmm. show up much more presently mm-hmm. versus when you don't do that self-care, you're constantly exhausted or in pain. And it's like, yeah, then it makes that connection a little more challenging. And then again, you're going to have good days and bad days with Mm -hmm. it. But I love how it's like, hey, it's okay for me to say, no, honey, you go, you know, spend the day with your friend over here and her family and, Mm -hmm. you know, mom or dad, I need to, you know, rest a little bit type of thing. So I love that. Yeah. Self-care is key. (laughs) It is. It is. And there's nothing wrong with it. (laughs) No, definitely not. Yeah. Well, I'm wondering if you would, wouldn't would mind sharing a little bit if, if parents, let's say their daughter has just been, maybe it's more recently kind of diagnosed with whether it's a chronic illness or they've been dealing with some chronic illness or medical issue um, for a while now, how can they support their daughter who has been diagnosed with that? What are some of the steps maybe parents could do that maybe they, they don't know about or that they thought they were or weren't doing type of thing, but mm-hmm. what are some of the things that they could do? Yeah, so I mean, it's hard enough if the parent has a chronic health condition or chronic pain, but if the, the tables are turned and it's their their daughter who has been given a recent diagnosis, it can really it can really be daunting and overwhelming and really intensify the parent's anxiety and worry because either way, whether it's the parent with chronic pain or the child with chronic pain, there is this element of fear because there is there is the unknown. You know, we all like to know or have a plan of of how we see life going for ourselves and, and for our, ch- our children. And so when that gets challenged in a way where, hey, my daughter has chronic pain, oh, well, maybe she's not going to be able to continue playing sports. Mm-hmm. And, you know, she's so talented in volleyball and now you know, what does this mean? You know, maybe she won't have an opportunity to compete and earn a scholarship for college. I mean, it can have these these impacts potentially. And so it can just really be anxiety provoking. And so the best thing parents can really do is work on their own emotions and, and keeping that in check. They need to kind of get an outlet for that, express it to themselves or with a therapist or, or some kind of support with the medical doctors who are maybe involved in their daughter's care, just so that way their anxiety and worry doesn't feed into their daughter's anxiety and worry. Um, so really getting a good anchoring of finding that way to cope and have an outlet I think is the first step in giving your daughter that that time and space to freak out to be upset where you're that source of stability for them. Yeah. And I love what you're talking about is really what you had talked about even earlier, right? That is managing your own expectations. It's managing the emotions and managing Mm -hmm. those expectations, whether that comes from your own belief system or if it comes from societal or world belief Mm -hmm. systems, being able to, again, reach out, get the support that you need to be able to work through that so it doesn't feel quite so overwhelming or daunting mm-hmm. or, oh, my gosh, you know, she's never going to be able to do blank, whatever that exactly. may be. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, because I see that happen a lot. You know, I mean, it's a natural response. You know, something's wrong with your child. It's mm-hmm. like, oh, my gosh, it, you know, it, it can really get under your, your skin and make you feel anxious. But unfortunately, anxiety feeds anxiety. And so, you know, and kids are, you know, they're very in tune with, with mm-hmm. you know, how their parents are feeling emotionally. And so, and the other key is that emotions and pain can really feed into each other. So, if someone's feeling really overwhelmed and depressed and angry and all of this, that can intensify 
that child or adult who's in pain, their um, experience with that pain, it could really intensify uh, the symptoms. Yeah, absolutely can. So yeah. what are, I guess, what are some of them, the tips or tools that you give, whether it's the, the teenage girl who's coming in saying, hey, you know, I, I have this chronic illness, or chronic pain, and or my parents do as well. What are some of the ways you help them begin to manage that besides kind of encouraging them the social support like we've talked about before mm -hmm. or journaling or I love the expressive arts stuff too because that's mm -hmm. another great way of being able to kind of work through the thoughts and the emotions on paper where you don't have to necessarily use the words. What mm -hmm. are some maybe other tips or tools that you offer your clients? Well, depending on where they're at, you know, they could just be at the beginning stages. And so many times they're they're having this inner dialogue within themselves and they're just they're just freaking out. They're just mm -hmm. like kind of spinning their wheels. So it might it might mean um, if they come in, giving them that that opportunity to really just kind of vent and talk because they might be getting shut down elsewhere and wanting to share how they feel and what's going on with them physically. And this might really be the only space where they can do that without feeling judged or criticized or, oh, you're being so dramatic or, oh, I don't want to keep hearing about this. You're, you're talking about this persistent migraine pain again or this, you know, like, uh, you know, it used to be fun hanging out with you so-and-so, you know, but now that's all you talk about. And so, a kid going through chronic pain, you know, can strain relationships. Mm -hmm. So just giving them that space of just having the opportunity to talk about all that they're going through, I think is the first, you know, one of the first things to do. And then once they kind of are able to really have that opportunity to let that out and express it and process it and grieve and go through those emotions, you know, then then they're at a better place emotionally and physically to kind of for us to work into more of like, okay, so what can you do? What are some things you can do? Um, or what can I teach you? Because I'd also don't want to overwhelm them either with things right away. They might not be ready for that at, in the moment. They might be just be overwhelmed just trying to process this new diagnosis. So, you know, I might, I like to use acceptance and commitment therapy as, as an approach of like, you don't have to accept that this is where you're at and that this is the way it's going to be the rest of your life. But if these symptoms are showing up in your body and you have these physical pain symptoms, I wonder if that's your body's way of trying to tell you something. What do you think that's about? What experiences have you had where you have felt more comfort within your body, where you felt the, the severity of symptoms kind of go down a little bit. Like, what was that? What, what is it that you did? So focusing on what they're already doing mm -hmm. and really um, bringing the attention to what is working. Um, because when something goes wrong, it's in our human condition to just, uh, just kind of focus on that negative thing of like, oh, this is going wrong. This is terrible. This is terrible. It's like, well, you're right. I'm not disagreeing with you. But what else is going on that is actually working? Let's try and challenge our way of thinking um, so that way we're not just focusing on what's not working, but we're also working on, oh, what might be able to help me or what have I done in the past that has helped? So really doing a bit of a cognitive behavioral approach there, too, of like, let's let's try and draw the attention. So at least it's 50 50, like, let's try and go there. So so it's not totally in the in the one of like the negative thoughts. Let's see what we can do to bring attention to how you are already supporting yourself because you intuitively know that you know, taking a nice hot bath makes you feel good. And you're already doing that. That's great. See, you, you know, so really building, building up their, their resources that they're using already, and really uh, strengthening up their, the message of, hey, you know what, yeah, this is overwhelming, but you know yourself, you know your body, and you've already realized and made some connections already that taking a nice bath or going to get a massage or just going with mom to get a manicure, pedicure makes you feel good. And you don't, and you're not really feeling um, so much physical pain. So, you know, you're doing this already. And then introducing other things like acceptance, commitment therapy, other cognitive behavioral uh, techniques, mindfulness. I'm a big mm -hmm. proponent of mindfulness. And, and also I like to use emotional freedom technique, also known as tapping. Um, so it just depends on the, the age of, of the, the teen or the child coming in and, and where they're at, you know, what direction I go. Well, and I love that too, because I was sitting there listening to you going like, wow, these are great things for parents who are listening to this of, hey, if, if my daughter doesn't necessarily have a therapist and maybe she doesn't need one at this point in time, here are some things that I could do as a parent is the first mm -hmm. thing you said, right, is just hear her, 
mm-hmm. be that support without judgment, without trying to fix it, to change it for her. Just right. let her be where she is. Mm-hmm. And then the second part of it, where you were talking about really empowering her and like, what have you done? What are mm-hmm. things, what are ways that you, you know, have kind of felt unstuck or got out of the that negative? Because you're right, our brain does love to go to the negative and get stuck mm-hmm. there sometimes. Mm-hmm. So really empowering her, like, what are those resources that you've told me about in the past and mm-hmm. reminding her of those things. So I love how a whole family can really mm-hmm. work on looking at how do we support one another in some of these struggles or in some of these you know, sufferings that we have in this moment so mm-hmm. that we don't stay stuck, that we can't ever do anything different or we can't enjoy life because mm-hmm. you really can. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Life doesn't end just because something happened. It's like, this is just uh, a challenge. Yes. Un- it's an unwelcome yes. event for right. sure. <laughs> <laughs> right. But we're we're strong we're strong we can yeah. we can persevere you know absolutely well I, yeah. you, I know you just touched a little bit about the EFT or the tapping technique I would love would you mind explaining that a little bit more to our listeners I know what it is and I think it's awesome stuff <laughs> but I would love hey. it. Yeah. <laughs> if you would talk a little bit more about that yeah so um, I I'm a big fan of uh, EFT or emotional freedom technique or tapping it goes by all these names and what's so nice about it is you're um, you're kind of using uh, acupressure points in the body um, and you're using your fingers as the as the tapping device so you actually physically tap on these different points in the body and you combine it with statements or phrases that really kind of align with how you're feeling in the moment so maybe you're feeling frustrated and you've got this like burning achy pain in your neck that's just like gotten so much worse the past day because the day before you really pushed yourself and you did more than you know you should have and now you're paying the consequences and it's just you know so it's a it's a matter of kind of coming up with like an opening statement at the beginning and you would start at the side of the hand with that and you'd say it about three times and you say it out loud so it might sound a little strange to people but what I like to emphasize is that this this has been clinically researched. It's been used specifically to help people with chronic illness, chronic pain, people with PTSD. There's been a lot of clinical studies showing how it is actually an effective method in um, addressing trauma and, um, and physiological, biological um, ailments and physical pain. So for, for anyone who's a skeptic, I totally understand. But yeah, so it might look a little strange, but right. it does have a, a therapeutic impact and it benefits the body biologically too. So if we're stressed out, for instance, which having chronic pain will stress you out both emotionally, mm-hmm. like, oh, I'm so angry or this is so frustrating or you know, in your social interactions, I'm not able to do as much because I'm hurting and I just have to take a break right now. And ugh. But it also has a biological impact on the body because the body's under distress. If there's pain, that likely points to there being inflammation. And so it can just be this persistent cycle. And so what I like about tapping is that um, you're actually helping to lower cortisol levels. And that's been studied. If you were to tap and not do anything else, not do any of the phrases, but tap for about 30 minutes, you actually can have marked decreases in your cortisol levels. Wow. And yeah. And that was measured with saliva samples. So they did saliva swabs on the inner cheek before the person started tapping. Then they did it for 30 minutes and they did another saliva sample and the cortisol went down. So there is this biological component that's really uh, fascinating. So yeah, you start with the side of the hand, you do these opening statements, then you start and then you move on to the top of the head. Um, there's some variations, but I start and go with the top of the head and then uh, and I just tap with two fingers or three fingers. And then I move to the beginning of the eyebrow, and then I move to the side of the eye, um, right in front of the temple, and then under the eye where you're touching on that cheekbone, and then under the nose, I tap with two fingers there, and then at the crease of the chin, two fingers there, and then I go to the collarbone, and I keep an open hand on the collarbone, so I'm tapping on both of the, of the collarbones. And then the last one I do is under the arm, basically where a woman's bra is. It's like the side um, under the arm area. And so you could literally just kind of do round after round with tapping statements and you can self-assess. So if I were to use this with someone, they would kind of self-report on a scale of one to 10, like where they're at with this frustration that they're feeling or with this pain in their back. Maybe they started at eight. And then after a few rounds of tapping in 
the hopeful outcome is that that level of intensity has moved down maybe to a six or to a four. Um, and so the goal is to keep working on it. And as you tap on these different things, something else might come up. So this happened recently where I was working with someone and we did tapping and they kind of were just staying at a seven. They started at an eight and moved to a seven. And I said, okay, if we're still at the seven, that means that something else is coming up. And so it really helps to get the person to tune in with the within their body and with their emotions mm-hmm. and get outside of that thinking model of talk therapy. And it's like, okay, I know this is a bit different, but let's not Let's just keep silent right now. If you don't mind, close your eyes, kind of scan your body and just kind of tune in and see what comes up for you physically or if an emotion comes up or an experience from your past comes up. And then, you know, usually something does come up. They're like, yeah, you know what? Now when you said this, this is what I'm thinking. I said, okay, so that's what we got to tap on now. So that's what's really nice is it's basically client driven. You know, Mm -hmm. they're the guide because they are their own best expert in what's going on within their body and what it is that they're feeling. And so I kind of help them along in that process, help them to structure how, you know, they might word things and, you know, um, what emotions help them to better articulate the emotions that are coming up or what experience in the past is coming up that, that all of a sudden is, you know, showing up and it's like, oh, that's surprising. So anyways, it's, it, it could, I could go on and on, but that's a snippet. <laughs> yeah. And again, nobody can see, but I'm shaking my head, you know, going, yeah, yeah. Because I love how, again, you're really trying to, again, kind of, it does look a little woo-woo-y for some people. I get it. It looks very strange when you actually do the, this exercise or this technique. And at the same time, I love how you incorporate saying, hey, there's scientific evidence of how that really works and what it has done over the years. And I, I was not aware that that it can bring down that cortisol level, which is most of my clientele that I work with are highly anxious, right? And those cortisol levels, when you are chronically anxious, they go, they stay high and you can get adrenal fatigue, you can have hardening of the arteries, all kinds of yucky stuff can happen when that cortisol level is not managed so well. So I love this is another way for people to be able to decrease that and to manage it, whether chronic pain, anxiety, depressed, um, you know, post-traumatic stress disorder, there's so many things that it, it impacts in a healthy way. So I love that you walked us through that. So thank you. You're welcome. And actually, I'm glad you mentioned that cortisol because there's another, I'm also a big uh, therapist geek when it comes to like neuroscience. <laughs> and this this does have a neuroscience element too, because it helps to calm down the stress response in, in the body. So when we're stressed, anxious, in pain, that activates our sympathetic nervous system. And that can kind of go into hyperdrive and just keep going and going and going. And that can have long-term effects potentially in yeah. a person's overall health whether or not they have chronic pain or not. So it can snowball. And so this this helps to calm that stress response and promote the parasympathetic, that rest and digest. And anyone who's dealing with chronic pain or illness, um, it's always good to remind them, hey, you know, we want to promote that relaxation in the body, mm-hmm. promote that parasympathetic nervous system to kick in because that's the real that's really the only time the body can work on making repairs and on healing and resting and having optimal digestion and working on tissue repair and organ support and all of these different aspects. So, and if we're constantly stressed and anxious and we're not able to kind of manage that in a better way, it's it will in theory be harder to work on improving the what's going on physically within their body and their symptoms yeah absolutely and i know for for teenagers you know this is a really there's so much going on in their brains during this developmental stage whether they're a tween or a teen So this Mm -hmm. would be a great technique for them to begin to learn this so that they can manage whether it's the school stress or if they've got conflicts kind of going on with mom and dad. This is a way for them to be able to be able to lower that stress level. And I love, too, that this technique teaches that mind-body connection, which you do through mindfulness. I do as well in my practice. Mm -hmm. It's so important. Yeah, we're up in our heads a lot and dropping down (laughs) and tuning into our body and what is it telling us great Mm -hmm. way to stay aware and then again be able to articulate the emotions or the memories that come up or how to manage things in a healthier way so i love it yay (laughs) i love it too (laughs) (laughs) 
Well, I know we, we've got to kind of wrap up here. And I'm curious, is there any other pieces of advice or any books that you typically would recommend to parents and or, you know, adolescents regarding kind of how to continue to manage or cope with the chronic pain, chronic illness, anything like that? You know, I think one exercise that I like um, that parents can use easily, its I think it's quite popular, is one called the rose and the thorn. I'm not sure if that's something you've heard of before, but mm-hmm. but it's really like just taking time uh, at the end of each day, whether it's dinner time or bedtime, depending on the age of the, of the child or teen, just having a conversation as a family of like, what was your highlight of the day? What was the best mm-hmm. thing that happened in your day? And what was the thing that was like frustrating or really challenging? Because that just sends the message of like, hey, it's okay for us to talk about the good stuff and the stuff that's challenging like we don't have to avoid talking about the difficult things so it helps to reinforce that like you know if the if the teen or tween is is not feeling well physically it's okay to talk about it you can Mm -hmm. talk to mom and dad about that that's totally fine anytime you need to talk so it helps to reinforce that and also vice versa if it's the parent who's got physical pain conditions or health conditions based on what's age appropriate for you know for their child or teen just saying yeah you know today was a little bit harder I had more pain in my shoulders and um, you know I was feeling more fatigued today but you know what that's okay I'm sure tomorrow will be better but just having that dialogue to just help to demystify and not make it something of like, oh, this is, we don't talk about these things. So it just, just like a regular practice or a, a more frequent practice can help reinforce that. But then with the thorn, it's like, okay, this was something that happened that was um, not ideal. I didn't, I did not, you know, want this to happen. It was frustrating. Hmm. But what, what can I learn from it? Like, what is the, what is something that I can take away from it as a nice reframe? So it helps to kind of, again, like address that mindset shift. So I think that's really helpful regardless if it's the child or the or the adult um, going through something yeah. uh, physically. I love and, that. Yeah. yeah. And as far as books, I do have a book that I, um, I'm a big fan of Peter Levine. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, <laughs> and he has a book called Freedom from Pain. And so in that book, it's kind of like a workbook. And so it's pretty um, user friendly geared towards the patient or the person dealing with uh, physical pain. And so it's like movement practices. And, you know, I think there's an audio included as well. And so that's, that's a nice option to kind of give people some um, things that they can implement on their own. And as other resources, I would say, you know, you can always go to my website. I have quite a few um, blogs where I post about chronic pain and how to manage it and some different ideas and how, how to, how to think about and process um, those experiences, you know, just some tips or suggestions to think about. And I'm trying to think what else I have. Well, before you go on, if you think of the other things, let's go back a little bit then, because I love yeah, that you've sure. got resources on your page. So how, help our audience know then how can they get a hold of you? What is your your website information. And I'll put, again, I'll put it in the show notes. So how could they get a hold of you or find those resources? Yeah. So they can go to uh, www.westlakevillage-counseling.com. And that's um, Westlake is West and then Lake. So it's pretty, so westlakevillage-counseling.com. And that's where they'll find me. And my phone number is listed on uh, the top of the page there. You can look at my, um, my articles that I've written Mm -hmm. and, and also on my website, I have a guided meditation audio that's um, free Excellent. to download. Yeah, I, I actually went to, I, I live about 30 minutes uh, away from Malibu. So I went to Malibu and recorded the waves. <laughs> Lovely. <laughs> I felt so artistic. And then I uh, did the little, uh, about an eight minute um, uh, guided meditation with the waves in the background. And um, so, yeah, so if people want to get that uh, free audio, they can download it. They just provide their email. It gets emailed to them and they can download it on their computer, cell phone, whatever. Um, And also when they do that, they get um, an email from me about once a month, no more than that, um, letting them know about what offerings I have, what community presentations I might be um, providing in, in the next month or so. And, um, you know, my latest articles on topics like chronic pain and illness. Excellent. Well, yeah. just wealth of information. And I love how you're also doing, you know, talks out there for the local community as well. So for any of the listeners who are in your area, they can definitely check out those offerings. So I love that. Well, thank you. Yeah. I love it too. <laughs> yeah, love that, love that. Well, Daniela, thank you so much for being on today and sharing, I guess, while helping our all of our listeners really gain a better understanding of how parents, families, teens can 
you know, manage the chronic pain, how they can be supportive of one another, how they can support their daughters, how they can also stay connected. And the tips and the tools that you gave them through this talk today about ways they can help manage that. So again, if they're not seeing a therapist, here are some tips and tools and otherwise, you know, seek that extra support out to help manage that. And you are definitely one of those support systems that are out there for folks. So again, thank you so much for taking the time and for sharing your knowledge. Well, thank you so much for having me. It was so nice talking to you and sharing all of this information. I want to say thank you to all my listeners and for those of you who have written to me about topics you were interested in hearing about. I invite you to sign up for my newsletter to stay up to date and receive other parenting tips or information about upcoming events at launchingyourdaughter.com. I will also include a video showing the tapping technique Daniela discusses in the show in those show notes. Thank you again for listening. Thank you for listening to Launching Your Daughter with Nicole Burgess, Licensed Marriage and Family Therapist. For more information or to stay up to date, go to launchingyourdaughter.com. You can sign up for my email list or join my Facebook group. Thank you.